Did you know that Al Capone had a Cadillac? Not just any Cadillac, but an armored one. Scarface often drove it through the streets, where a gun could stick out of every window. Cadillac, the guarantor of security. The details are accurate to the millimeter. Let's take a trip back to the beginning of the last century and find out why Cadillac was about to be disbanded, and why Henry Ford would be the villain today. Cadillac's history began in France in the 16th century. There lived a boy, Antoine de la Mothe Cadillac. He loved theology, studied zoology, and caught butterflies. Cadillac's father had money, but he ran into influential people and they sued him, not forgetting to take away his fortune. Cadillac Sr. was pushed out of court, and his son went down a slippery slope. Drunkenness, debauchery, all in all, a normal peasant youth. The authorities decided to take Antoine by the scruff of the neck, and boom, he's already in the army, where he makes friends with the officers and begins to engage in illegal schemes. We don't know what he was caught up in. All we know is that he was going to get married, but not to the woman he wanted more than his life, but to another, <laughs> relatively unattractive lady. Antoine didn't like to get married without love, so instead he got on board a ship with the help of the officers, only after departure to learn that he was going to America to kill the natives and hunt for pelts. In the new land, Cadillac became a warlord. He roughed up the locals, turned into a trader, and built a house with a 17-year-old wife inside. The wife, however, sometimes didn't see Antoine for years. Cadillac sails away, sometimes in a canoe, and after about four winters comes back with 80 tons of skins. Anyway, Antoine had a pretty good life. He founded Detroit, the future city of the auto industry, and ruined homes. Detroit, that's where his passions would rumble. Now, flying into the 20th century, Meet Henry Lalonde, an engineer who learned from his grandfather Colt and assembled guns for Lincoln's supporters during the Civil War. Freedom won and Lalonde dove into fitting mechanisms, rose to an executive position, and his colleagues said of him, quote, a handy man, he'll fix the brains of hard of hearing people. Henry Lalonde is all about hard work perseverance and diligence. When he chiseled out a hair-cutting machine, everyone in the USA started wearing a brush cut. Then Henry dove into the auto industry. He was already a respectable mister, with a tie and a mustache. One day, some solid people came to see Lalonde. They said, Henry, sir, we're losing money in this factory. We want to tear it down. Should we do it right away, or will it wait? It'll wait, said Lalonde and invented his first car. Yes, folks, Uncle Ford worked for that company. Henry wanted to make race cars, but the factories didn't want to work. Not enough dough. When Lalonde came in, he immediately started telling Ford how to do business. The talented engineer decided to make ordinary cars. Ford decided it was of no interest to him and left, taking the name Henry Ford Company with him. Lalonde, on the other hand, poured over drawings. In 1902, the Cadillac Model A came out. Yes, the company was named in honor of the French Sir who founded the city of car manufacturers. The car was reliable and comfortable, and most importantly, it could pull a cart uphill. Henry Lalonde turned his cars into a Lego constructor. Parts were as interchangeable as the magazines in an AK, or bolts in an M16. One day, a British car club even took three Cadillacs apart, shuffled the parts, and reassembled the cars in front of onlookers. A little later, these models drove 500 miles. Anyway, the Cadillacs got a bonus and moved on. And then there were small trucks, covered cabs, and leak-proof interiors. That would have been fine, but they didn't make some of the parts right. That flaw killed the man who was Henry Lalonde's friend. Byron Carter, that was the name of the man who once started his stale car. 
Byron twisted the elastic knob, the car started, and he let it go. The knob bounced off his head, and from the impact, Byron died after a little while. It took a long time for Lalonde to come to terms with the loss of his friend. When Henry stepped back, he said, I won't let any more cars hurt people. The electric starter nestled in the Cadillac stuffing. It allowed the car to start smoothly, and it gave people confidence. Electric headlights. The Cadillac was the first to have a high beam. Finally, you didn't have to carry shovels for bodies that had been run over. But that's just our fantasies. At the same time, Bill Durant was watching. An unassuming guy who would later take over Buick, Chevrolet, Oldsmobile, and the Cadillac. Mr. Durant said, Join our automobile company and I'll give you $5.6 million. Lalonde took the money and decided it was time to do his business. He had to become a giant tycoon who would flatten the globe by his belly. On this basis, Lalonde leaves Cadillac and starts the Lincoln Motor Company. And then Mr. Henry meets another Henry, Henry Ford. Ford noticed just in time that things were going badly for Lincoln. He quickly bought it and remembered to take revenge on Lalonde. At first, he thought he still had the steering wheel in his hands. But soon, saboteurs began to show up at the plants. They presented themselves as young men, trainees who would gain experience and get a job. In reality, these were Ford's people who were secretly taking over. When Lalonde saw the whole thing, it was too late. He lost control, and he and his son were demonstratively escorted out of the building. Detroit. It was here, in the old cottage, that Henry lived out his last days. Let's remember this old man. He was the armage of engineering, a beloved leader, and he wasn't a bad person either. Goodbye, Grandpa Lalonde. You were 88 years old when you left the world, and your firm kept taking off and almost made it to heaven. Cadillac, on the other hand, was making armored cars. Powerful engine, gear levers. The army quickly took notice of the excellent ergonomics, and after the outbreak of World War I, 2,000 armored clunkers, Cadillac Type 55 Touring Model went to the front. After the war came the Roaring Twenties. Cadillac welcomed new faces. They were the first to hire a designer, Harley Earl, who first made chariots for Hollywood and drew LaSalle for the company. Gangster verticals, shatterproof glass, there was even a door that held golf clubs. It was Harley Earl who smelted the grill, the trademark of all Cadillacs, which you want to lick to a shine. By the way, in the 20s, Capone drove a Cadillac. He had an armored van from 1928. The gangster was put in jail anyway, but the government confiscated his car. Rumor has it that Roosevelt himself privatized this beauty, and when asked where he got the luxury armored car, Franklin said, Quote, I hope Mr. Capone doesn't mind. Power boosters, steel roofs, silent transmissions. Why do we need this? It's boring and incomprehensible. Let's move on to World War II. Cadillac began stamping tanks for the front. You heard it right, folks. Tanks, the M5 Stewart. This was the first machine rolled off the assembly line, and the war devoured a total of 1,470 pieces of such vehicles. During the war, a female designer also came to the company. At first, Helen Rotter drew comics for the future Marvel, and then she went from jewelry to the auto industry. Helen was engaged in the upholstery of interiors. Check it out. The idol of retrofuturism, the Firebird 2. It wasn't a fallout car, it was a real machine. The turbine blew 225 horses, and it had autopilot. No, better than that, autopilot prototype. Cadillac thought to place beacons in the roadblocks. Well, as on the runway, between them, Firebirds would race, gaining 185 miles per hour. However, the idea has remained on paper, and real cars are more interesting. By the way, we also have a video about this story on our channel. 
Many models of Cadillacs were developed by female designers. That's why the Brome included a makeup kit and magnetic glasses. The seats remembered the shape of the owner's bottom, which made steering more comfortable. Power antenna, power windows, automatic door locks. And these were not all the secrets of the little Brome. Here, for example, tail fins. They even became the subject of debate. Harley Earl wanted to lower them, and his colleagues wanted to raise them. In the end, when Earl left, designers just redrew the drawings and raised fins by 1.5 inches. And they went over in a big way. The fins became the trademark of the Cadillacs, although there were more serious innovations. The Cadillac Cyclone, for example, was equipped with radar. Special radars caught objects in front, and if you got too close to them, the cabin would beep with a special siren. Then came climate control and airbags. And then there were underground laboratories with 3D printers right around the 80s. And it's about time. There's no limit to perfection. That was Cadillac's slogan. Cadillac won the Motor Trend Award five times. And in 1984, it was listed in the Guinness Book of World's Records, the longest car, 40 feet, four wheels. Cadillac even boasted that their assembly line was 9,000 miles, though taking into account the transfer of models to Italy. Did you know that Cadillacs didn't have enough runways? Yep, loaded Boeings did not fit in the airport, so they had to pour concrete in order to make the Allant E model see the world. What's more, the Cadillacs even had NVDs. Night vision gave you the ability to not hit a deer in the dark, and therefore was useful to mere mortals, and probably the FBI as well. Okay, next we have... Hmm, what? Excuse me? Oh, excuse me. We just got word that an FBI agent has contacted us. He's ready to be interviewed and talk about the President's Cadillac. Sir, sir, hello, good evening. Yes, good evening. My name is Classified. Served in the FBI from 84 to 2000. Uh, roger that, Mr. X. Can you tell us about the President's Cadillac? Well, there's nothing criminal here. It started with Hoover and Eisenhower. The former took a Cadillac to the victory parade, the latter to his inauguration. Then I got into the FBI. It took four years to assemble one car because you have to sew armor plates, armored glass, and fully seal the interior so it was quiet inside. So no one could get in. The door is eight inches thick. Obama's Cadillac, for example, weighs eight tons. The armor is heavy, but it can withstand a shot from an anti-tank grenade launcher. The door there weighs as much as a Boeing's one. You can't break through it with any caliber. And they put oxygen in the cabin so they can breathe. It's important to the president. <laughs> Thank you, sir. And if the president's car is written off, where will it go? It will be destroyed immediately. The Secret Service is in charge of that. They park the car, fire on it, throw grenades at it. In general, they check to see how good the president felt there. I don't say anything else about it. What about Bill Clinton's Fleetwood? As far as we know, it's standing in the presidential library right in front of the visitors. Yes, unfortunately, that's correct. I was strongly against the idea, but Clinton was adamant. Like, the windows are tinted. Like, no one is allowed in the cabin. But the fact that the Cadillac is out in the open, they could easily steal the technology. Thank you, Mr. X. Let's move on into our current days. Did you know the Pope had a Cadillac with armored glass? There was a special glass container with a papal seat in it. It was the Pope Mobile that saved the pontiff from an assassination attempt. He was attacked by a 16-year-old. But what about the Cadillac now? Is it worth buying? In 2018, Cadillac stopped being the most popular national premium brand in the US market for the first time in post-war history. It was overtaken by Elon Musk sitting behind the wheel of a Tesla. Despite its successes, the company is directly affiliated with General Motors, and GM itself has become a clumsy giant. Starting with the Chevy Corvair story, 
It's as if the company is deliberately burying itself and dragging Cadillac behind it. But we'll tell you all about that later. So thanks for watching, and goodbye for now.